And good evening. It is very dangerous out west. Tonight, nearly 6 million Americans are under red flag warnings as gusty winds and dry conditions fuel wildfires from New Mexico to California all the way up into Nebraska. Aerial footage, take a look, shows several multi-million dollar homes up in flames in Laguna Niguel, California, after ocean winds caused a brush fire to rapidly spread. Hundreds forced to flee with little time to leave or pack up any belongings. Firefighters are appearing to gain some ground at this hour. But so far, at least 20 homes have been destroyed and the devastation is overwhelming. Nearly 1,000 homes are still under evacuation orders. We want to get right to Miguel Almaguer, who leads us off from inside the fire zone. The firefight here unfolded door to door. Multi million dollar estates in the gated hills outside Laguna Beach devoured in minutes as unstoppable flames tore through nearly two dozen homes. A relatively small blaze, the fire size was no indication of its fury. It seems like a war zone out here. Raging off California's pristine coastline, the inferno was fanned by 30 mile an hour offshore winds and drought conditions flames exploded up the mountains. I saw flashes of fires just coming in my house and that was the time that we just left. It was fast evacuations that saved lives. Let's go! Sasan Darian and his daughter escaped with seconds to spare. We're just gonna go. The sky looked like a partial eclipse and the heat, the, the heat of the fire had come on our skin so I had to just ru rush out real quick, leave all the belongings inside. One neighborhood home to nearly all the damage. Despite the level of destruction here, crews say the damage could have been so much worse. They're now trying to stop embers from going from one rooftop to another. With the West off to a devastating fire season, winds have whipped this year's most destructive blazes. Nearly six million are under red flag warnings, conditions destined for disaster in Arizona, New Mexico, and California, where veteran firefighters say these are unprecedented times. We're seeing fire spread in ways that we haven't, you know, at least in the, the 44 years that I've been a firefighter. It's no longer the new normal, this is our normal. Tonight, a sobering reality where Mother Nature's beauty is entangled in her fury. All right, Miguel joins us now from Southern California in that area known as Laguna Niguel. Miguel, that area is just majestic and now completely devastated. Are there any leads on what caused these wildfires? Well, Tom, no official cause yet, but authorities are concerned that there was some downed power equipment in this area that may have sparked the fire. That's under investigation. In the meantime, the folks who live at homes like the one you're seeing now aren't worried about how this fire started. Instead, they're worried about who will pay for it and when they'll be able to come back home. Tom. Miguel Almaguer leading us off from a home charred by those fires. Miguel, our thanks to you and your team. For more on these conditions fueling these flames and how long they will last, I want to bring in Al Roger tonight. Al, I know you're tracking where these wildfires are happening. Yeah, that's right, Tom. And in fact, we're about four months ahead of schedule as far as these wildfires are concerned. Look at the drought monitor. The western half of the country is in drought, and we are looking at really this extreme drought. It's the driest January to April on record. 60% of the state in extreme drought. That's up from 40% just last week. The rainfall amounts less than 20% for L.A., San Francisco, and Long Beach. And the big problem is we've got red flag, flag warnings for 6 million people from the Rockies all the way into the southwest, and the flames have just been going crazy. We're talking about over 12 million acres, 1.2 million acres so far burned. That's twice as what we had last year, and we're only four months into the year, Tom. Already doubled up. That's incredible. I know besides the wildfire, you and your team are tracking uh, extreme temperatures and yep. severe weather. That's right. We've got this warm Warm ridge, I mean, really a deep ridge of warm, uh, high pressure, and that's bringing in really record like temperatures from Houston 94, Little Rock 92. Buffalo is going to be 83 degrees tomorrow. That's really hot. And we are also looking at these severe storms firing up. We've got tornado watches in the Dakotas, severe thunderstorm watches from Michigan all the way down into Kansas. We've got a risk of severe weather today. 12 million people, this area in red, this is where we could be looking at 
nocturnal tornadoes, twice as deadly as your usual variety. Then for tomorrow, we've got a risk right now stretching from Green Bay, Wisconsin, all the way into Oklahoma for 8 million people, damaging winds, hail, and very gusty conditions. The heavy rain is going to be up into the plains, more than four inches. However, what we're really worried about, the hail and the winds, Tom. We thank Al for that. The other major headline tonight that we're following, the nationwide shortage of infant formula. It's growing worse every day, leaving more parents desperate for the nutrition their children need. President Biden is vowing to step in and cut the red tape to increase supplies, but the crisis has become especially urgent for the most vulnerable. NBC's Joe Link Kent with some new reporting tonight. Here you go. Tonight, the Biden White House under growing pressure to act with millions of families unable to get infant formula. Our message to parents is we hear you, we want to do everything we can, and we're going to cut every element of red tape. Parents like Haley Rubble say they have no choice but to hit the road to find the formula her eight-month-old son Isaac relies on, driving up to four hours to track it down. We've searched shelves from Texas to Colorado to Oklahoma to Kansas City anything and everything and it, they're empty. Rubble is one of millions of parents nationwide searching not just for formula, but also for answers as the national out of stock average rises to 43 percent. Congress calling emergency hearings, saying the situation is alarming, with the administration now considering the use of the Defense Production Act to address this shortage. I think when you look at the Defense Production Act, you have to ensure that it would actually achieve what you're trying to achieve. And so we're also looking at that as well. The White House is also urging state and federal regulators to crack down on price gouging. The months long shortage is a perfect storm of high demand for formula in the pandemic, ongoing supply chain delays and a voluntary recall by manufacturer Abbott Nutrition, prompting the shutdown of their plant in Sturgis, Michigan. The plant is the only supplier of many specialty formulas, which doctors say children with metabolic disorders rely on for life. And he's asked me a couple of times if like this means that he's going to die. Mom Jordan Coleman needs it for her nine year old son Carter. Each day that passes, we are getting closer to that point where we are not going to have any of his regular formula left that could put him in the hospital. Abbott now tells NBC News that it immediately implemented corrections to address the items the FDA raised following its March inspection. And subject to FDA approval, we could restart our Sturgis, Michigan site within two weeks. From the time we restart the site, it will take six to eight weeks before product is available on shelves. But the FDA tells NBC News they're still concerned that Abbott has not addressed risks of contamination during their production process. As families face a summer of shortages, some saying that relief could come far too late. Those parents need it. All right, we thank Joe Link Kent for that right there. We turn out of the economy and the massive collapse of cryptocurrency. All types of coins affected with one now worth nearly nothing. With more on what's fueling the crash and how this is affecting investors, here's Priscilla Thompson. Crypto obviously right now getting crushed. Investors getting jolted by volatility rippling through the crypto world. Tonight, a massive sell-off of cryptocurrency, erasing more than $200 billion from the entire market in a single day. Bitcoin is down more than 50% from the high. One minute it looks like the market's going to rip, the next minute it looks like the market's going to dip, and I don't know what in the world's going on, so I'm out no mas. The price of Bitcoin plunging to its lowest level in 16 months. The second largest digital currency, Ether, tanking below $2,000 a coin, down more than $1,000 from a month ago. The numbers sending some investors spiraling, fearing they could lose it all. In total, it seems crazy to say, but I'm down around $35,000. I actually lost over half my portfolio. I've lost many, many big amounts of money. <laughs> One of the hardest hit coins, Luna, erasing 99% of its value, now worth nearly nothing. I lost 1.6 million on Luna, and then I put in another 200k and I lost that as well. I mean, this is the definition of a black swan event. This is the Lehman Brothers collapse of crypto. What is happening right now? A lot of people are in a world of hurt right now, and they're getting a rude awakening of what it's like to be in the crypto markets again. Crypto is a roller coaster, so you gotta buckle up and enjoy the ride. Christine Lee covers the crypto market for Coindesk. She says the crypto sell-off mirrors what's happening in the overall stock market, with investors fleeing as fears over soaring inflation and recession grow. As institutional investors leave 
the traditional markets are also taking money out of cryptocurrencies and that is causing a huge amplified dive in the crypto markets. Trading platform Coinbase now warning that if they go belly up, customers could lose all their crypto investments, which aren't technically subject to bankruptcy protections. El Salvador, which began recognizing Bitcoin as legal tender in September and buying it up by the boatload, now facing the possibility of defaulting on the country's debt. History is filled with almost this as crypto made a huge PR bet spending big on high profile ads like this one starring Matt Damon fortune favors the brave they went all in on the Super Bowl too with heavy hitters like Larry David it's a safe and easy way to get into crypto I don't think so. And LeBron James lending their celebrity to the craze. We going to the league. And it didn't stop there. Crypto.com spent $700 million for naming rights to the Staples Center. Crypto exchange FTX spending $135 million to rename the home of the Miami Heat. Investors fearing all that ad money could turn into a bad punchline. Where do things go from here? Those who have survived previous crypto winters have seen the light again. Do we have a sense of how long that will take? We have no idea. All right, so for more on this crypto winter, Priscilla Thompson joins us now live from here in 30 Rock. So Priscilla, you've been tracking investor reaction and talking to experts all day. What's your sense on the impact this is having on people's bottom line? Yeah, Tom, there are people saying that they've lost hundreds of thousands, even more than a million uh, in this sort of cryptocurrency spiral. But experts tell me while that is likely true for some people, that is not true for the majority of people. In fact, I'm told common advice when it comes to crypto is investing anywhere from one to five percent of your overall net worth. And the rule here, as with any investment, always be prepared for the possibility that you could lose it. Tom. Priscilla Thompson with that major headline on cryptocurrency tonight. Priscilla, we thank you for that. With hundreds of billions of cryptocurrency wiped out from the market in just a single day, I want to bring in CNBC's crypto guru and technology reporter, Kate Rooney. So, Kate, you've been covering the crypto craze, right? The lifestyle, the conferences in Miami and the Bahamas, crypto mayors, even crypto's heads of state like in El Salvador. What's the reaction tonight from the evangelists who have been preaching about crypto for years? Yeah, Tom, well, it's good to see you. A lot of people I'm talking to in the crypto market are really shaken up right now. Prices really have wiped away most of the gains from last year. There's a lot of people who have lost a lot of money in the past week. But people you talk to have been through these downturns before if they've been in these markets for a while. Um, and it, they talk about what is known sometimes as a crypto winter, the idea that you might see 80 percent losses from the peak to the trough. And we're getting there at this point. Uh, Bitcoin is down significantly from the high. But a lot of people that are, have a long-term view here, the Bitcoin bulls, talk about this as a decades-plus investment. So they're saying they're going to sit tight and wait it out. Kate, if you can, just briefly, though, what, what happened here? Because crypto was supposed to be sort of insulated. What's driving this mad dash from, from coins like Ether and Bitcoin? Yeah, so there's a type of cryptocurrency called a stable coin. And the big thing you need to know is it's just supposed to be pegged one-to-one -one with the price of the dollar. So Bitcoin is known to be pretty volatile. These stable coins are just supposed to trade at one dollar. A big one collapsed this week. It's called Terra USD. It fell to around 23 cents and it hasn't recovered yet. So there was a sort of a run on the, uh, a run on a bank, as you might think about it. People lost confidence in this cryptocurrency and really rushed for the exit. So a lot of sellers at the same time that dragged down a lot of the bigger cryptocurrencies. People tend to invest in more than one. If they lose a ton of money on one of these cryptocurrencies, they often have to sell out of another big one. So Bitcoin uh, did fall, and that was one of the big reasons. And investor confidence is also a big part of that. People just lost confidence in the entire ecosystem. It hit Bitcoin prices as well. One of the reasons why we're doing this story is the latest NBC News poll showed about 21 percent. I think that's right. 21 percent of Americans have invested in crypto. And within that, a lot of the wealth is fairly concentrated. Is this the kind of event where you sort of kind of run out the hobbyist investor and the institutional sort of investors say, is this worth it? Like essentially, is the viability of crypto itself on the line right now? Yeah, so weeks like this really have flushed out a lot of buyers. And um, the longer-term holders tend to be a little bit less price-sensitive. So if they got in a couple of years ago, they're more likely to hold on to their cryptocurrency for a longer time period because they're not underwater. But the big risk here is that some of the millions of new buyers that have gotten in in the past couple of years 
are underwater, meaning they've lost money in the markets, and they're looking just to sell out and leave. Um, it will take a lot more to get them feeling comfortable again investing in that asset class. There's a stat uh, it, last week that we pulled from a data firm called Glassnode showing that about 40 percent of crypto investors across the board are underwater. So there's a lot of people who might say, you know, this just isn't worth it. And that's a bad thing for prices. You want to have supply and demand. When demand is higher than the supply, the price goes up. The demand really is not there from the new buyers who might say, hey, I got into this a year ago. I'm underwater. I'm going to sell out. And by the way, I'm not going to tell my friends to invest or my family to invest. And that's really been a hallmark of some of these bull markets we've talked about in the past is new buyers, retail buyers, which are essentially individuals coming in and supporting the prices. That's really missing right now. And it is a risk to cryptocurrency that some of the newer buyers are scared away and they're not going to come back and buy the dip. 40 percent underwater. OK, uh, Kate Rooney for us tonight. Kate, thank you for that. Next tonight, we turn to the urgent manhunt underway in Dallas after police say a shooter walked into a Korean owned hair salon and opened fire. Three women rushed to the hospital. That suspect, you see him there, he's still on the run. Authorities do not know the motive and have not ruled out it as a hate crime just yet. NBC's Inclay SMW has more. Tonight, three women shot at a Korean-owned hair salon. The gunman still at large. An unknown black male suspect stopped his vehicle on Royal Lane, walked across the parking lot armed with a weapon. According to police, on Wednesday, an unidentified man seen in these surveillance photos provided by police walked into the Hair World Salon located in the Dallas, Texas area's Asian Trade District, or Koreatown. Apparently, when he came in, he shouted something that they cannot figure it out yet, and then uh, he started shooting. He entered the business and then began shooting multiple rounds. Police say three women were shot. The man then returned to his vehicle seen here. He's described as a black male with a thin build, around 5'7 to 5'10, with curly hair. The person just parked his car and came in and fired the gun and left immediately. Jeremy Kim works at a local Korean radio station. He says the attack has the community on edge. You know, there are so many businesses around here, but he just specified the Korean owned hair salon and came in, the fire the gun and left immediately. So um, we're just worrying what was the reason. The three women were taken to a local hospital. Dallas police do not yet know a motive and have not ruled out a hate crime. This shooting coming just a year after the Atlanta spa mass shooting in March 2021 that killed eight people, six Asian women. He deliberately chose three different locations most of the victims being primarily Asian women. He Grief for the Asian American community compounded after years of deadly attacks. Women that look like me are constantly being attacked. We're being harassed and now we're being killed. According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, anti-Asian hate crimes increased 339% in 2021 compared to the year prior. Stop Asian hate! Authorities in Texas now asking for help identifying the suspect as they seek to keep the community calm. This brings an added fear in this community and we want to make sure that we do what we can to ease their, uh, uh, ease their fear. We heard it right there. Authorities are asking for the public's help on this one. Zinclay SMW joins us now. Zinclay, any update on that suspected shooter? So, Tom, the FBI's field office says it's coordinating closely with Dallas police and Crime Stoppers will pay up to $5,000 for information that leads to arrest and indictment of this suspect. But so far, no leads. Tom? All right, Zinclay, SMW for us tonight. We want to head overseas now. The leaders of Finland declaring they want to join NATO without delay, but the announcement drew immediate condemnation from Russia as it battles for control of eastern Ukraine. Kelly Kobieja is there with more. Tonight, as Russia intensifies its assault on eastern Ukraine, the Kremlin now vowing retaliatory steps after Finland's announcement it will seek to join NATO, with Sweden expected to follow. Russia says it considers the move a threat. Finland shares more than 800 miles of border with Russia and has been neutral for decades. If that would be the case that we join, well, my response would be that you caused this. Look at the mirror. Russia previously demanded that Ukraine not join NATO, using it as a justification for its invasion. Ukraine's president conceding back in March it was no longer possible because NATO would likely not let them in. 
In a speech overnight, President Zelensky said if Ukraine had been part of NATO before the war, there would have been no war. Today, Ukraine's prosecutor general announced the first captured Russian soldier will stand trial for alleged war crimes. A 21-year-old sergeant charged with shooting a 62-year-old unarmed civilian on a bicycle. And why did you leave your village? Ivan and Maria told us they escaped their small village 80 miles from Mariupol. A rocket hit our house. It blew up our home. But we, by a miracle, survived. She says Russian forces are stealing everything, furniture, cars, and sending the locals to Russia. Today, the U.N. human rights chief said they found a 1,000 bodies of civilians in the Kyiv region alone, calling the scale of unlawful killings shocking. Tom? Shocking is right. Kelly Kobiea for us again from Ukraine. Kelly, thank you. Back here at home now, we have an update on a story we first brought you here on Top Story last night. A bus of women lacrosse players from a historically black college pulled over in Georgia during a traffic stop but searched for drugs. None were found. The players claiming it was a case of racial profiling. Now, the Delaware Attorney General is asking for a federal civil rights review of the incident. One of the students that was on that bus joins us on Top Story in just a moment. But first, here's Blaine Alexander with the latest. It started with a stop, as routine as any other. A large bus pulled over in South Georgia late last month. The reason why I'm stopping is for a left lane violation. On board, members of the women's lacrosse team from Delaware State University, a historically black school. The team was returning from a match. This body camera video shows officers speaking with the driver when one officer says their drug-sniffing dog gave an alert outside of the bus. His colleague responded. There's a bunch of dang schoolgirls on the bus. It's probably some weed, maybe. That's when officers began to search the luggage. So if there is something in there that is questionable, please tell me now, um, because if we find it, Guess what? We're not going to be able to help you. Okay? At one point, a deputy found a wrapped package. A student tells him it's a gift from her aunt. We're going to open it. We have to. In the end, no drugs were ever found. Now the team and their coach say they were victims of racial profiling. The officers were just saying they do it to everyone and they weren't singling us out. Sydney Anderson plays on the team. Did you believe the officers? Not, not at the slightest. I think they came on the bus, saw that we were a majority black team, and just assume that we had drugs on us. But the Liberty County Sheriff says in a known drug corridor, other vehicles were also searched. I do not exercise racial profiling, allow racial profiling, or encourage racial profiling. For what I have gathered, I believe that the stop was legal. Tonight, Delaware's governor is calling the incident upsetting, concerning, and disappointing. And the state attorney general is calling on the DOJ to investigate. Blaine Alexander, NBC News. All right, we thank Blaine for that report. Joining Top Story right now is one of the Delaware State women's lacrosse players who was on that bus, senior Anaya Aiken. Anaya, I, I first want to ask you if you can walk us through what you experienced on the bus that day. Well, me and my um, teammates were traveling back from Florida. Um, we had a three, game, three games that week, um, so we were traveling back. So we were pulled over on the side of the road, and we noticed that Mr. Tim got off the bus because we were pulled over. So, of course, our first instinct was to record because, you know, we've had incidents. We've seen incidents like that, African-Americans being pulled over on the side of the road by officers. So the officer came onto the bus and he told us that he pulled us over because Mr. Tim, our bus driver, was driving in the left lane. So, like, five minutes later, he came back on a bus saying that um, they're searching us for drugs. So... We realized, like... Anaya, what was that we... moment like? What was that moment like when they come back and they, they, they said they're going to start searching for drugs? Well, when they said they were searching for drugs, it was unsettling and easy for us because how did a traffic stop go to searching for drugs? So we, like, he saw who was on a bus and they started searching for drugs. That's what we started thinking of. Regardless, and you didn't have to do this, but did you guys even say, hey, listen, we're a college lacrosse team? Like, what, what's going on here? Yes, we did, which made it even more like, why are they looking on the bus for us? Um, looking for anything. We're coming back from traveling traveling from Florida, having our games. We just wanted to get back home. And this was the last thing we expected. So it was very um, uneasy. Yeah, I mean, you say it's uneasy, but, but tell me how it really feels. I mean, you're a college student. You're playing sports. 
you, you're really doing everything right. You guys are traveling on the bus. You, you, you're just trying to have a college experience, and then this happens. I mean, what, what is that like inside? It doesn't feel good. Like, it was very disappointing, but, like, it wasn't shocking because, like, we've seen it in the media. Like, we, me and my teammates, we weren't shocked. Like, it's some of our first times. Like, it was just more, like, disappointing. Is that why you guys started rolling? Because you, you figured something like this could possibly happen? Yes. And what did the cops do when you guys started rolling on them? They just continued searching. They didn't do anything. Did they apologize? Did anything, did they say anything after they found no drugs in any of the bags after they searched them? They said we were able to continue on back to Delaware. Did, did you ask them what did we do wrong? Did anybody say why, why did we have to go through this? Um, our teammates, they said it's a routine. They, they do this um, all the time. It just didn't sit right with us at all. If you had a chance to speak to those two officers tonight, what would you tell them? Um, just to tell them, like, that wasn't right. We're a group of college students. Um, it Like, it just felt like they were racially profiling us because it went from him coming on a bus saying we were in the left lane when we were not supposed to, to him saying that they're checking for marijuana. So, of course, that looks like you're racially profiling our team, who's predominantly African-American. We, we heard there from the sheriff of the department who said that he doesn't allow racial profiling and that this wasn't racial profiling. What do you say to that? I don't believe that at all. Like I said, they went from a traffic stop to them searching for marijuana after he saw who was on the bus. So I don't agree with his you statement. Think, you, think it, you think it's because once they boarded the bus and they saw the color of your skin, they decided to start searching for drugs? Yes. What do you want to be done? Well, I just want them to take accountability of their actions and know that that situation was not right and that they need to, like, you know, I don't, um, they just need to watch, like, what they, like, they need to control, like, their actions and be account, take accountability for their actions. Uh, what has been the, rela the, the, the reaction on your campus so far? Um, people have been very supportive of us um, having our back with everything that's going on. And finally, you know, you are graduating. Is this, is this going to impact your college experience at all? It definitely was a crazy way to end my senior year off. Um, but I have very supportive teammates. Um, we have each other's back, and I know we will get through this together. Ania Aiken from Delaware State, uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you for talking to us here on Top Story. Still ahead tonight, the highway inferno, the explosive crash on a highway caught on camera. What we're learning about the drivers who needed to be extracted from the burning wreckage and the incredible moment a group of strangers rushed to stop a car as it rolled through an intersection, the driver suffering a medical emergency. What that driver told us about the kindness and the courage that may have saved her life. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Thursday. All right, we're back now with an incredible moment caught on camera in South Florida. A woman passing out while driving through a busy intersection, her life saved by a group of good Samaritans. Issa Gutierrez talked to that woman and her rescuer. Tonight, new video of that extraordinary community rescue caught on camera. Watch as this car rolls into a busy intersection in Florida. The driver passed out at the wheel. Moments later, a woman jumps out of her car to stop the vehicle and warn others before more rush in to help. We have an elderly woman that is unconscious at the wheel. Um, we got about three or four people holding her car. Tonight, that video released by Boynton Beach Police gone viral and those good Samaritans hailed as heroes. The woman inside the car now speaking out. I was shocked. I don't have words. I don't have Actions, I have nothing to say how much I, I appreciate them. Lori Rabier says she suffered convulsions before stopping at the light, something doctors told her might have been caused by a new medication and her fasting in preparation for a medical procedure. Before seeing this video, how did you think that you had survived this? I didn't, I had no idea what happened. I don't remember any of it. I just thank God for people like the people who helped me and the people who stopped. New video obtained by Top Story reveals another angle of the moment her Mazda hatchback starts drifting as cars drive by. Watch the first helper leap into action, waving her arms as she runs into oncoming traffic. 
So I just decided to put my car in parking and just run to see if I could save her life and stop the car. Jeanette Rivera, it turns out, is Rabier's co-worker. They just left for work together. You ran into one of the busiest intersections in the city. Were you scared? No, I didn't think of nothing else. I just thought about saving a life. When Rivera got to the car, a terrifying sight. I see her like this laying down, passing out, and I bang at the window and try to open the door, but I couldn't do it. So I tried to yell and wave my hands. In my head, it was like, is she dead? Then, as the light changes, another good Samaritan runs over. A local army recruiter leaves his car to help, too. He spoke to WPTV. When I heard her say she's unconscious, she's unconscious, that's when I was like, I have to do something. Soon, more join in, using their bodies to physically stop the car. One woman supplies a dumbbell to smash through a window. The citizen rescuers manage to open a door and put the car in park before wheeling it over to a nearby parking lot. An onlooking nurse provided medical care while emergency services arrived. I was almost in tears watching this. There's different people from different places all coming together to uh, save this lady, putting themselves in harm's way. And I'm looking at that and I'm seeing angels. Police counted at least nine people who helped save Rabier. For Rabier, the shocking video bringing perspective. It's making me want to be closer to my children and my grandchildren. We're not going to be here forever and now's the time. These are really an incredible series of events there that were captured on camera. But you were telling me earlier today there was so much that was not captured on video. Absolutely, Tom. Police were telling me that there was actually a U.S. postal worker who was in her truck. She saw what was going on, got out of her truck, and was directing traffic so that these Good Samaritans and Rabier wouldn't get hit. She was just off of the camera. And also, that moment you saw a man jump in briefly uh, into the vehicle, he was actually trying to unlock the car so that they could get to her and put the car into park. Police told me he jumped into broken glass. They still don't know if he's okay. They're in the process of trying to identify all of the people help, who helped out. They want to thank them. They're actually holding a ceremony tomorrow to celebrate them. Rabier tells me she is really looking forward to meeting all of them in person and thanking them herself. So incredible, and they are really are all heroes. Issa, we thank you for that. I also want to highlight that happened in the great state of Florida. All right, when we come back, pilots grounded. The punishment just handed down to the pair who attempted this now viral mid-air stunt that sent a plane crashing to the ground. Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the search for a missing Chicago man after his girlfriend's body was found in Lake Michigan. Authorities say 26-year-old Daniel Sotella was last seen on April 30th boarding a train. It's the same day his girlfriend, 22-year-old Natalie Brooks, and you see her here, went missing. The college student was found dead three days later, no word yet on her cause of death. Next to the explosive crash on a highway in Ohio, take a look at this. A traffic cam capturing the moment a dump truck slammed into a Department of Transportation vehicle, erupting into a fireball. It happened on Interstate 77 outside of Akron. Both drivers need to be extracted from their vehicles, but they were taken to the hospital and are expected to survive. The cause of this is still under investigation. And the FAA has revoked the license of two Red Bull pilots after a failed mid-air stunt over Arizona. You, remain, you may remember this video. We showed it to you, I think, last week or a couple weeks ago. The duo attempted to jump into each other's planes after sending them into nosedives at 14,000 feet. However, one of the planes crashed forcing one pilot to use a parachute. No one was injured, but the FAA says a request to carry out the stunt had been denied. All right, next tonight, we turn to the U.S. in the midst of yet another COVID surge. So for the first time since January, the country's seen three consecutive days of more than 100,000 cases, hospitalizations and deaths climbing as well. This is President Biden ordering flags flown at half staff today to mark a somber milestone, one million dead in this country since the start of the pandemic. Each irreplaceable, irreplaceable losses, each leaving behind a family, a community, forever changed because of this pandemic. All right, joining us now on set is Dr. Susanna Hills, a pediatric airway surgeon at Columbia University Medical Center. So, Dr. Hills, how can you tell our, our audience where we are at during this COVID pandemic right now? 
Well, certainly, um, we're seeing an increase in cases, that's for sure. And I think it's more than what we realize because many, many people are testing at home. And these are tests that aren't necessarily being counted in the numbers we're seeing. But hospitalizations, although they're up a little bit, have not been increasing um, in, in a huge way. And so I think what we're seeing is that cases are increasing, more people are being infected, but people are vaccinated, many are boosted, and have some immunity against the virus. Talk to me about this variant because it's spreading pretty fast. Do health professionals professionals attribute that to the to the type of variant or because maybe mask rules are, have been relaxed a little bit it was just Easter Passover people were getting together yeah I think the second half of what you said hits right on what I was concerned about when they mentioned that we were thinking about lifting that mask mandate um, yes that constellation of travel plus vacation plus lifting Easter Passover and lifting the mask mandate I think probably um, pushed the numbers up and and kind of pushed the wave of this current surge forward a little bit um, and I think also we're seeing that the virus is adapting we're seeing variants that are a little more virulent and this most recent variant is a little more transmissible as well so you know even Dr. Fauci has sort of talked about us just living with, through the pandemic and kind of living with this and obviously there's COVID fatigue throughout the country a lot of people are tired of wearing masks but yeah. someone like you a health professional says people should still be wearing them so so what's the right balance right I mean we've been living with this for two years how do we get that right balance where we can kind of live through the pandemic but maybe relax some of the rules and just sort of learn to live with COVID in our lives yeah and that's the really tough question Tom I think it really depends on a few factors one what are the case numbers what are the positive test rates in your surrounding area um, and in your state it depends on how many people in your region and in your area are vaccinated and I think now we have to really pay attention to who's boosted because we're seeing as we go longer away from when people were boosted or vaccinated immunity starts to wane do we know if the variants will keep getting stronger and stronger? I mean, we had Omicron that was so contagious, right? But it wasn't as bad. I, I, I had it. This variant seems to be a little bit stronger. Yes, I think the, the goal of the virus is to be very transmissible, but to not be so, so virulent that people are, that the death rate is high because it wants to continue to be passed along. It doesn't want to kill its host. So the ideal virus is very transmissible, but it doesn't necessarily kill the host. I think we're seeing increase in transmissibility, not necessarily an increase in virulence. That depends variant to variant. Well, final question for you. What do you think the last, the, or I should say the next six months look like? Yeah. So I think the key is that right now we have boosters and vaccines that are slightly waning in their efficacy over time. And so we're going to see, I think people need to get boosted or need to complete their vaccination series to stay healthy. We're going to continue to see some cases, but we're entering the summer. Case numbers hopefully will drop and hopefully we'll get a break. Dr. Susanna Hills, we thank you so much from Columbia University. We thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to turn now to Top Stories Global Watch. We begin with frightening moments on a runway in southwestern China. Take a look at this. Cell phone video shows a Tibet Airlines plane up in flames after it skidded off the runway during takeoff and caught fire. All 113 passengers and nine crew members were evacuated safely. More than 40 passengers suffered minor injuries. Lufthansa Airlines is apologizing after refusing to let Jewish passengers onto a flight after members of one group refused to wear masks. Cell phone video captured a flight attendant telling a passenger he and his daughter could not board a flight from Frankfurt to Budapest because a group of Jewish passengers traveling were not complying with the rules. The man was not with that group and says anyone who could be identified as Jewish was blocked. Lufthansa is now reviewing the incident. All right, coming up, kids and smartphones. Most young people are now glued to their devices. So how young is too young to buy your child their first cell phone? What the experts say when we come back. All right, we are back now with a look at the question many parents grapple with. When should I allow my child to have a smartphone? A majority of kids have their own smartphone by the age of 12 and many even younger than that. But with teenagers now spending an average of nine hours a day on their devices, a growing number of parents are bucking that trend. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has more. The pandemic changed everything, including the way kids learned and spent their free time. According to Common Sense Media, screen use for teens and tweens has grown by 17% since 2019, with kids 8 to 12 clocking five and a half hours a day, and 13 to 18 year olds logging nearly nine hours a day on devices. Now many parents are pumping the brakes. 
For mom of four, Adriana Stacy, the family policy has always been firm. We don't buy smartphones for our children. She's a psychiatrist who's seen the effects of increased screen time in her practice. I'll get a patient in my office, usually a teenager, who all of a sudden started to really struggle with anxiety and depression. Pretty much every time we can trace that back to when did you get a phone? But her oldest, Annalise, a 10th grader, often feels left out. It's definitely hard sometimes because I have been like left out of decisions because I haven't been on a group chat or something. It's also been a struggle in the classroom. Some of Annalise's teachers ask students to use their smartphones to do classwork. We do feel like we're standing alone on an island. But the island is getting bigger. A movement called Wait Until 8th encourages parents to wait until at least 8th grade to give kids smartphones. The network is 40,000 families strong, and they've seen a 25% increase in participation in the last year alone. Parents have seen the impact of screens on kids over the past couple of years with online school and lots of social media consumption. Let's get our kids outside. Let's get our kids reading. Let's get our kids playing with other kids in real life. Let's let our kids enjoy being kids. Research about the impact of smartphones is mixed. A large study using data from the National Institutes of Health found screen time was moderately associated with worse mental health, increased behavior problems, decreased academic performance, and poorer sleep, but also found using a smartphone or device improved friendships and connection. Dr. Jean Twangy is a professor of psychology at San Diego State and author of the book iGen. Are we basically experimenting on our kids, not knowing what the impact of these smartphones will be long term? All of us are basically living in a big social experiment where smartphones have taken over. In effect, we're experimenting with their brains. Hey, let's give them all a smartphone and see what happens. Experts agree if parents are going to allow smartphones, they should be banned from the bedroom overnight, and they recommend setting time limits and parental controls. And for the growing number of parents who decide not to give their kids a smartphone at all, talk to your kids about your concerns and consider a stripped-down phone for calls and texts only. Last year, Annalise Stacy got one of those. At 15 years old, she already sees the benefits of not having a smartphone. It's been a positive experience not growing up with one because I spent more time doing more valuable things and less time on my phone. I have better self-esteem and better social skills and I can definitely like communicate and just talk to people more. Adriana admits this has not been easy and it's obviously every parent's choice, but there was one study from the University of Texas that stood out to us. They gave people a series of tests without a smartphone nearby and then while they had their smartphone near them, just having the phone within reach, even though they weren't touching it, was enough of a distraction that they didn't concentrate or do as well on those tests. Back to you. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.